important panel on climate financing. It would have been part of uh, a great deal of work that the Middle East Institute has been doing on climate change. And today specifically, we're talking on climate, uh, on climate financing. Um, who gets what money to help with what? Uh, we are extremely lucky with our panel today. Um, um, Dr. Abba Abdelatif is the Executive Director and Director of Research of the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies. She's also the Chair of the Presidential Advisory Council for Economic Development. She was a member of the committee that drafted Egypt's current constitution. She is a member of the Central Bank of Egypt's Coordinating Council, and she's a board member of the National Bank of Egypt. Um, just as importantly, however, as um, exec director and director of research for the Egyptian Center on Economic Studies, uh, ECS has done some really stellar work on climate change this year in the run-up to COP27, and I do encourage people to look it up on their website. Dr. Paul Number Um is uh, the Regional Director of the World Bank's Infrastructure Department in the Middle East and North Africa, but he also has extensive experience in Southern, Western and Central Africa. Now he is an engineer by trade, but um, thanks to some time in Cambridge, he is also now an expert on uh, uh, managing sustainability with climate change and development. And his uh, PhD is from Miami University. And last and by no means least, uh, Dr. Nicholas Schultz is the Chair for Climate Policy at Edelman Global Advisory. Uh, Nicholas is a long-standing authority on climate and sustainability study issues, uh, 30 years of it. And during those 30 years, um, he was last a, a key member of Conservation International's leadership team. He's um, spent time in public and international, uh, public and private international organizations, one of them the UN, and also um, assistant uh, director of the Global Green Growth Institute in South Korea. And um, his PhD is in pharmaceuticals from Paris University. So everybody, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to kick off by, by just noting something that most people are probably aware of. Um, back in uh, 2015 in uh, uh, Copenhagen, um, developed countries uh, um, promised that they would uh, uh, um, that they would supply about a hundred billion dollars a year in climate financing to help uh, countries cope with climate change. This was reiterated in Paris and extended through to 2015, uh, 2025. Um, it isn't happening. That money isn't coming through. Um, a recent report by the, a very recent report by the OECD uh, um, said that among other things, uh, much of the money was coming in from multilateral uh, funding, not so much private, and we'll get to, the, to that in a moment. But Paul, I want to kick this off by asking you, as uh, I mean, the World Bank is, I think, the, the, the largest multilateral uh, donor, um, 32 billion, I think, this year, almost 32 billion this year. Um, so what are the advantages of, of multilateral uh, funding versus bilateral funding? And do you think enough is being done? That was a good, thank you, Maria. I mean, it's a good question. And thank you for inviting me to, to the panel, first of all. And uh, I think the conversation we're going to have is timely, given that we are just two, two weeks away from COP27. Mm -hmm. And I think some of what we're going to discuss today here, we will also discuss it at COP in Sharm el Sheikh, right? So clearly the question is right. I think the $100 billion announced in 2015 are still expected. And as a matter of fact, when you look at the reality of the needs, I think the $100 million might not even be uh, sufficient. But coming to climate finance overall, I believe that, uh, I mean, we really need a global, uh, a, a global initiative on that. I mean, it's really about revisiting the governance of, of global finance on climate. Mm -hmm. There's too many kind of windows. And I think if you take the standpoint of a receiving recipient countries, it's not always easy to know which window to access. But let me go back to what the World Bank has done and why the World Bank and other multilateral development agencies have been more forthcoming on this. As you rightly pointed out, I think the World Bank last year 
provided $32 billion for climate finance. This represents around 36% of our total financing to development. The way we look at climate finance is really we look at it through the development lens. And as you know, we have just completed 25 country climate diagnostic report. The reason we're doing this report is that we really believe that countries facing the most critical challenges related to climate are not necessarily the countries which are at the root causes of a climate crisis. I mean, when you look at MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region, that region sits at the middle of a climate storm. It's a climate storm that we see every day, rising sea level, rising temperature, land degradation, coastal degradation. I mean, as a matter of fact, when you look at the realities of the consequences of the climate change, I mean, our people in the region face this reality. Water scarcity has become a critical. In some countries like Jordan, it's even an existential kind of challenge. I mean, if Jordan cannot guarantee the water, the fresh water to its people, Jordan as a country may not just be Jordan we know today. And we know they are facing huge acute water scarcity. Why development, multilateral development banks are better positioned is our structure that allows us to also mobilize more resources for development. And we did the country climate diagnostic report for the sake of helping country to reconcile the climate obligation we have to fulfill to the development challenge that the country face. First of all, you need to address the development challenges, but you need to do that while preserving, while also complying with your climate obligation. And when you look at our group of countries, when we do this exercise, we come up to the conclusion but when it, when it comes to emissions, our countries represent a minimal amount of the emission in greenhouse gases. I mean, MENA as a region is around 8%. We have some, I mean, important emitters, growing emitters, but we still not represent, I mean, the huge amount of emission that you see. The bulk of a problem in terms of challenges is falling on our, our people because the emission has taken place, then climate has changed, and then we see the consequences. And these consequences comes in front of water scarcity. I mean, when you look at water scarcity, it has triple down implication in terms of livelihood, agriculture, food security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the adaptation becomes a critical issue to address. So our CCDR have shown. But when it comes to our region, it's really the adaptation and the resilience agenda that has the most important, uh, uh, what, what requires the most important attention. Uh, mitigation for us is an opportunity. Why? Because we have sun radiation, we have space, we have wind, and we can take advantage of the new technology for renewable energy to accelerate the deployment of renewable technology and tap the benefit attached to it by producing green energy, which can supply our electrical system, but also can help us green our economies while eventually exporting the rest. We can also, through that process, create more jobs. So it's that comprehensive approach of looking at opportunities through mitigation, because we don't emit much, but we can take advantage of opportunities that lies around it, particularly renewable energy. We can, as a group of countries, expand the deployment, scale up the deployment of renewable energy, green our electrical system. And if we green, if we green our electrical system, we will be able to green our economies, meaning you can green transport through electric mobility, you can green energy uh, industries, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also supply that green energy to Europe. And this is what you see happening now across the region. You have a transmission line submarine cable being looked into between Egypt and Greece for that purpose, which will allow Egypt to expand the amount of renewable energy that they can generate. You have a transmission submarine cable between Italy and Tunisia. And all of that is going to help the region to position itself much better going forward because we can also create jobs. We did a study that shows 
that if we were to achieve a 42% renewable energy target that Egypt has in its NDCs, Egypt could create 2 million jobs from now to 2035. 2 million new jobs and well and high paying jobs. These are jobs that will replace some of the old jobs. But in addition, these are the 2 million net jobs which are not existing today, but could be created. So all in all, to respond to your question, we don't see a confrontation between multilateral and bilaterals. In fact, the two go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, bilateral aid, I mean, all these shareholders um, we, are, we, we, we have are also delivering the bilateral support to countries. So we really see com complementarity between bilateral and multilateral development system. The, the good things of MDBs is that, I mean, the agreed methodology for climate co-benefit is not a methodology only for the World Bank. It's a methodology that was agreed by all the MDBs. And we can do much more. But when you look at the climate finance needs, we are talking about trillions of dollars. So Thank what you. we're bringing is not much, but it's already something that kicks the light and kicks the, the train to the right direction. Let me stop there. Thank you so much. I'll come back to something that you mentioned um, later, but Abla, if I can switch to you for a second, because you mentioned um, climate financing possibly not being as much as uh, um, we want. I, my understanding is, uh, your opinion is that the funding just isn't sufficient. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me let me talk a little bit about that. First of all, I'm very happy that the World Bank is planning to help Egypt and create jobs. So that, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Always great news. <laughs> okay, the financing is definitely not enough. The 100 billion that are allocated, at least all studies prove that we need at least 600 percent. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, in order to take care of things. Okay, that's 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 number one. Number two, and that's actually a big problem, there is a, a green fund, there is an existing green fund, but yeah. access to that green fund is almost impossible. So mm -hmm. it's becoming a very infamous uh, uh, fund, actually. Um, the, the process takes a very long time for countries to be able to benefit from it in any way, mm -hmm. to be able to have any project funded, they could wait for years, which sort of defies the purpose of its, uh, of its existence, okay? Uh, but but at that, I, I think it's, 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 it's positive to try and say what can be done to improve the access to the, to, the green, uh, to the green fund, okay? And that's one of the things that became very clear in the webinars and, and the work that we've been doing on the, uh, on, the, on the climate change. One of them is for the developing countries to have accredited partners, to have partners like the United Nations Environment Program or the Green guarantee uh, a company, when they have those accredited partners, they have a long record of being able to tap, on, to tap those funds, and this improves the chances of the countries. If they put environmental targets and social targets as well, and social projects as well, this sells better, and it improves, uh, and it improves their access. I mean, those are solutions. I am very much focused on solutions because we've yeah. been repeating the problems uh, um, yeah. forever. Uh, uh, also, it's very useful for countries to have uh, official national organizations as to access the funds. Yes, they can access it through international uh, uh, agencies like the World Bank, but if in, even accessing the funds directly okay, might be better and easier if they have their, their national um, agencies to do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, it will improve if they have direct access to the fund. And of course, if countries collaborate together, they have a much better uh, situation. And that's a big problem in Africa. I mean, they're all acting as individuals when, if they collaborate regionally, okay, and look at the projects that they need at, uh, uh, by, by more than one country, their chances are, are higher. I thought uh, I'd just uh, uh, can, point that out. Hmm. Can I ask you a quick question? When you say collaborate, collaborate how? To talk to each other, have the same position. Okay. okay. As, they, as they face, uh, and Paul is smiling because he knows exactly that what I'm saying is true. They don't talk to each other. They don't have a mm -hmm. common position. So their position becomes extremely weak. Mm -hmm. Okay. They have national plans that do not take the climate into consideration. They do not have adaptation plans. Mm -hmm. Okay. If these are not there, okay, you add to it the capacity 
uh, the limited uh, capacity. They need a lot of capacity building, all the basic infrastructure. That's not that when you when you add all of these together, it actually decreases their chances of accessing uh, uh, the green funds. So part of it lies on the international uh, uh, community at large, but part of it also large with the African countries. That's part of the story. Let's uh, come Thank back you. to you. Thank you so much. We're going to come back to that in a bit. Nicholas, if I can come back to you, for, just come to you for a bit. Um, you've been doing this a long time, okay? Um, the, the need for, I mean, climate change has intruded on, on everyone's conscious in the most awful way over the past few years. And the, the need for climate financing to help countries cope with, with these issues is, is obvious. But we still have a lag in funding. We seem to have a lack in um, a, a desire to move forward, even though most countries and most companies uh, are, so both public and private sector are well aware of their commitments and the needs, and yet there is a lag. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be part of that uh, discussion. And I'm, I'm always, happy to take part in discussions around climate change and climate finance. Now, um, it, it's always a matter of half full or half empty. Um, we touched upon the 100 billion per year, which were committed, and you mentioned it uh, in Copenhagen back in 2015. Actually, today, reading the, in the Financial Times, it said we have reached 83 billion per yes. year. So well, it's not trivial. Uh, there is already, uh, there are quite a few uh, resources already made available. I think, and that might be shocking in, in a discussion around climate finance, I really think one has to move away from just a mere obsession with money and big uh, figures. I think the big issue really is absorption capacity. Where do you find bankable projects. Do you have enough projects which actually will attract private sector investors in any of the countries we're discussing? And that is really the, the bottleneck. So we need to look at where are, how can you, how can you have a good allocation of risks between the public sector? And when I, when I say the public sector, that obviously also includes the multilateral development banks and other players. Mm -hmm. and the private sector. Uh, there's an issue about risk reward profile. The mm -hmm. private sector is not investing because risks are too high. Mm -hmm. So there are many things governments have to do. I can, <laughs> I can mention a couple of them. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously have a, a decent regulatory environment to have the right signals, short term and long term, um, to have a good regulatory framework and to have uh, well-aligned and coherent sectoral policies. And that very often is lacking. What is also lacking very often from a government's point of view, or rather from a private sector investor's point of view, is a clear policy on developing pipelines of projects and being able to prioritize these at the country level. Because when I used to work for the Global Green Growth Institute, we, we would always say, well, if green growth was so fantastic and was the silver bullet, it would happen spontaneously. The reason why it is not happening is because there are many hurdles and the hurdles are very often linked to the regulatory environment, to the national conditions, and above all, to the lack of investable projects. So you, let me just pick something up that, that you mentioned. You said, um, the appropriate regulatory environment is important. And my understanding is that um, reporting from some of these countries can be difficult because a uh, uh, um, reporting on, on some of these issues is not necessarily mandatory in uh, some developing countries. It can be difficult to get the information. So occasionally we, we don't know how much effect is being had by, by what funding. And the other one, of course, is, as you, you mentioned, um, these are businesses. And therefore, uh, when you take into account uh, 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 return on investment and risk, much financing has gone into 
more developed countries. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, you know, it's well, I'll give you an example. If I, if I was an investor into a renewable energy project in any developing country, mm -hmm. I would be absolutely sure I can sign a power purchase agreement uh, over a number of years, which will allow me to mobilize project finance from the financial system. Mm -hmm. And that I am actually absolutely certain that this power purchase agreement is worth more than the paper it has been on. Yeah. So that's the key impediment to uh, actually investments taking place. And I think climate positive investments at scale absolutely require the um, the investments from uh, private sector players. Otherwise, you will never reach scale. It cannot be achieved just by public means. And therefore, it is essential that we look into where does the public sector have a role to play in reducing the risks that the private sector cannot take. And that's the reason why investments have actually gone more into developed countries. So thank you so much. But Paul, let, let me ask you about that, because as I understand it, part of the role of the World Bank is to offer advice to countries on how to proceed on many of these issues. So in which case, what are organizations like the World Bank and perhaps specifically the World Bank, what's being done to attempt to help uh, lesser developed countries help themselves? I think we're doing, we're doing exactly what uh, uh, um, Nicholas is talking about. I think the government role is to create the enabling environment, right? I mean, we're talking about trillions of dollars. Of course, this trillion of dollars for climate will not come only from the public sector. A bulk of it may and should come from the private sector, particularly when you look at the mitigation part. I mean, all the, all the investment that is needed in the renewable energy expansion to green and the, the electrical system, I mean, is likely to appeal to private sector to this extent. Uh, I mean, the enabling environment has been created by government. What does that mean? It means government needs to put together programs with bankable project. This project needed to be tendered out, private sector will bid out and will then mobilize the financing. And the banks are all ad adhering to, to the ESG uh, guidelines in order to be able to green their portfolio as well. So that's one. The second part of the funding will have to come from the public sector. Adaptation is key, particularly when you talk to Af about Africa. Most of investment for climate, which are really urgent and urgently needed in Africa today are in the adaptation part, meaning water scarcity issue I talked about, making sure that irrigation becomes less water intensive, like it becomes more, more efficient in the utilization of water, reducing the losses in the water system. I mean, in many of the countries, you produce 100 cubic meters of water, but you're losing 50% because your distribution network is not uh, updated. It's not maintained properly well. And then you have, um, I mean, the preservation of wetlands, the preservation of natural reserve, the ecosystem, all these things are adaptation. And there, the probability to attract private sector is pretty limited. And this is where the public sector should, should necessarily uh, focus. And in some case, probably with through some partnership, you can still attract uh, the, the private sector. And, and all of us together, we do advise country on how to put this plan and how to go and implement it. One last point from my end, the government itself, for its spending outlays, has the means and the, the, the levers to accelerate the transition to climate. Why? Because, I mean, the government controls a lot of the public procurement. And in many countries, the public procurement represent up to 20% of GDPs. Imagine if you were just to use your public procurement to say, I want it to be green, I don't want it to be gray, right? You can insulate houses, you can insulate buildings, you, you can do a lot of things which will help us consume less energies. Meaning that if you, if you rehabilitate the house, if you, if you want buildings to, to, to be retrofitted so that they can they be more insulated, I mean, then they will consume less energy either for cooling or for heating. Mm -hmm. And all of that can take place through government pro policies and government programs. So the government itself has a significant 
amount of power to channel the trend where the objective lies. Public sector through international donors like World Bank, we need to mobilize as other MDBs and all bilaterals to continue extending support to this government to finance the adaptation uh, emergency that we need to face. And finally, the private sector is really key, really key. Without the private sector, we will not achieve, I mean, the transition to, 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 to climate because most of the investment in the mitigation er arena will have and could have to be done by the private sector. And this is where, again, World Bank and others, we need to work with this government to help them establish enabling regulatory and policy environment. Thank you so much. Abla, let, let me ask you um, to, to pick up on both Nicholas and Paul's comments. I'm, I'm sorry to ask you to speak for all developing nations. I mean, it's a, it's a big gap, but, but still, what is stopping developing countries moving in these directions? I, I mean, if again, if you want to attract uh, 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 investment, if you want to attract funding, um, some things, of course, are easier said than done. But, but generally speaking, if you want to attract investment, what is to stop countries trying to provide the appropriate regulatory environment? Okay, um, thank you for the question. I, I agree with everything that Nicholas and, and Paul said. They definitely need to have bankable projects. They need to have pipeline projects. They need public and private investment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the government has a very big role. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, let me explain why this is not happening. Uh, in many developing countries, especially if you focus on the poor ones, okay, the least fortunate ones, they have priorities. Okay? You are talking to them about the climate and about being green and about changing the regulatory system to become green when they're actually having issues with food. They are having issues with political conflicts, mm -hmm. okay? These are caused actually, many of them actually caused by the climate problems. So the, in the priority list, climate concerns almost become a luxury, mm -hmm. okay? This is, this is a reality. This does not take the responsibility of the government, okay? Mm -hmm. Or deny any of what was said, but mm -hmm. this is actually the truth. Let me say though something specifically about, uh, about Africa, because I've, I've, all the work I've been doing in the last four months was on Africa. You know that Egypt is the voice of Africa in, in the COP27. Mm -hmm. Africa, uh, Africa contributes no more than 3% of the climate uh, damage, let's put it yeah. this way. And yeah. we have 20 developed countries, okay, three or four of which account for you know, 80% of mm -hmm. the thing, all yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So they are paying the price. They mm -hmm. are paying a hefty price. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that, that they see, and it's very realistic, right, that they definitely need help from the third partner. Let's put it this way. You have the private sector. You have the governments of these countries. The third partner is the international community. And I'm not talking about the international organizations like the World Bank and IMF. I'm talking about okay, the entire North. Okay? Why? Because there is an unfair situation that's taking place here. All the money that goes to Africa and to the poor country is going as, you know, let's say what, almost like charity money. You are giving the poor countries in order to help them survive. There is an issue of fairness and Africa is seeing this a lot, saying it's not, uh, it's not charity, it's our right because we did not contribute to the problem, okay? And we are bearing the full, the full price, okay? So this is, this is something that's actually quite important and it translates, uh, and it translates into many things. For example, yes, the investments in Africa are highly risky, okay? And this is why the private sector is not involved. Um, Western countries have lots of opportunities to benefit from investments in Africa, but they don't go because it's very risky, okay? Why not create a fund of some kind from the North, from the countries that are actually contributing to the problem in order to mitigate the risk of those projects. Why not, okay? The projects are risky. There needs to be mitigation, a guarantee for this risk. Why not put that fund, not out of, again, being kind hearted, okay? But actually out of having it as the fair right of those, of those countries. This is something. And, so and, I, and there is a, hmm, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just okay. So if I can just play David, devil's advocate here. You're essentially, you're, you're talking about loss and damage. And 
honestly, the only country uh, uh, that has uh, indicated in any way that it's willing to, 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 to put money into loss and damage was um, is Denmark. And that was about a month ago. Um, you, you, you're you saying that countries should do it because it's the fair thing and it's the right thing. And I, I don't argue it is the fair thing and it is the right thing. But if they don't want to do it, then I what are the chances of a fund being created? It appears to be that the only way forward is going to be for countries to invest rather than simply give money. Because giving, I mean, giving money is something that, that uh, 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 depends on how much money they, they want to give. Uh, and loans, of course, will get poorer countries into even more trouble. Mm -hmm. And giving money at the moment, especially in, and this is something I want to ask you about, in the, the current global uh, crisis, I mean, for example, are richer countries just going to say, mm, sorry, we've got this whole Russia, Ukraine thing, we don't have the money, can't help you. Likely to happen in, in a way. In a way, they're already doing it. Eighty-three billion is there. The the, the rest uh, is still to come. But then, it's not an issue. The the investment is going to have a high return. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm talking about creating a fund in order to reduce the risk, in order to push for it. Of course, it's being asked for like this. It's not going to happen. But I'm saying that if the developing countries, the less fortunate countries, are united and have a voice. This is something that they can negotiate mm -hmm. during the COP and ask and ask for. And by the way, it's going to be a win-win scenario at the end because the investment in Africa is going to benefit everybody. Okay, Africa actually is the, the lung of the of the entire world. All right, this is this is actually the case. If the money cannot be collected, speaking of the Ukraine war and what's happening, okay, two things are happening with the with the Ukraine Russia thing. Okay? One of them is that there is a bit of change of position from the north. Okay, on the climate issues. Germany is starting to use coal, okay? And they need that for energy. There is an energy crisis, so it's a reality. Mm -hmm. It's a reality. Okay, so then, then there is room actually for, 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 for moving a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. Because of the situation. Why not give Africa a chance as well? Instead of putting Africa always in a corner, you have to develop in a completely green way. From here on, you cannot use your, 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 your fossil fuels. Uh, yeah. You cannot do that. Okay. If the money cannot be collected, okay, why not release part of the debt of those countries? This is another way of doing it. You don't have to pay, but there is a there is a debt that those countries owe. Why not reduce? Why not reduce the debt? There are ways. Okay, there are mechanisms for 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 mobilizing the funds from the uh, uh, developed uh, uh, countries to the less fortunate ones in a way that will bring ultimately a win-win scenario. Why not facilitate the technology uh, uh, transfer, okay? And make it easy and make it cheap, okay? And again, do it not out of charity, but do it because it is the right of those countries. This is an issue in, in the um, ethics, okay? This is something that has to be discussed and understood and can be sold in the COP if it is sold, if it is mentioned properly and can be translated into solutions that are best for all. But then the catch, what's happening right now, when you hear the US, for instance, talking, John Kerry talking about the climate situation, he's very emotional. He's talking very strongly about, about the, the horrible future that we have for our children and grandchildren. But then when, and, and when it comes to investment, but this is business and it has to be a win-win scenario. Okay. Yes, it has to be a win-win scenario, but cover part of the cover part of the risk. Okay. Also help a continent like Africa build its ability to self-finance. Okay, this is an issue. The World Bank is going to give it money. It, this money is limited with a certain duration, certain amount, certain mm -hmm. types of projects. Mm -hmm. Let's help those countries build their ability to, to self-finance while at the same time requiring them to do exactly what Nicholas and Paul said. I'm not saying that this is not, I'm saying that this would complement the picture, okay? And it is a right, not charity. Thank you so much. Nicholas, can I come back to you for a moment, please? I mean, you, you, you've been listening to, to all of this. So I think the, the report that I referred to earlier said that, um, by the OECD, said that, that mobilization of private climate finance had been lower than um, anticipated, most of it going to middle-income countries. Um, 
as as we said, you've been doing this a long time. Has has have have the means of climate uh, financing changed? Have the have the methods changed? And if they haven't changed, are they keeping up with the times? I mean, are the same methods that we were using perhaps 10, 15 years ago, are they still suitable to the situation that we have at the moment? Right, that's an interesting question. But perhaps uh, I, I'd like to react also to some of the uh, statements made by, by colleagues here. Please, <laughs> please. <laughs> and, and we're, we're good with it. We like reacting. Uh, Please. I was sure. I was sure you're going to do that. I was sure of that. <laughs> we well, like that's reacting. What I'm here <laughs> for. That's what I'm here for. Um, Please, just to uh, react on on um, on on what uh, Paula said, and of course, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, adaptation is key, yeah. and of course, there is a role for the public sector to address uh, issues related to adaptation. I thought we we're talking about mitigation initially, but so oh, no, adaptation. Both mitigation and no, adaptation. No, 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 but we started on. Uh, I thought we started on the mitigation but anyway so uh adaptation absolutely clear agriculture coastal areas access to water and so on and so forth absolutely essential um where i would slightly beg to differ is on on the ability of governments to actually handle that because if you take developing country governments and this is a result of the global geopolitical changes um, post-COVID, post-war in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, post-strong uh, increase of the US dollar, these countries are very indebted, so they have very limited uh, fiscal policy leeway to actually invest uh, into uh, adaptation circumstances. I think uh, at this stage, I'd, I'd like to commend the uh, very interesting initiative launched by, G, by Germany on behalf of the G7, which is the Global Shield, which uh, Germany has launched together, or, or rather Germany on behalf of the G7, with the V20, the Vulnerable 20 uh, countries, to actually provide immediate response to whenever uh, a, a major disaster happens as a consequence of a lack of adaptation and to prepare countries to adapt more. So I think that's an initiative we, we need to, uh, to watch. On, on, and I'll come back to your question, uh, Mirette, but uh, uh, I'd like to react also to what uh, Abla has said. I think any discussion that goes into the direction of saying this is a right and not a charity it's not going to take us very far. I don't think that is something that is constructive. And in fact, uh, I think the entire discussion around loss and damage, and of course you're right. I mean, since the industrial revolution, it has been the developed countries that overwhelmingly contribute to the current situation. That is absolutely true. But I think the reality is if you look at current positions from the US or the European Union, Denmark excluded, um, I think it just seems to be a, a, a difficult uh, uh, way to proceed. I like your idea about a fund, creating a fund, but actually there are already quite a few of those instruments available. I mean, there's the, and Paul would know that, there's the Private Infrastructure Development Group, which has developed a whole range of risk-reducing instruments uh, which need to be deployed. I think now, and, and you mentioned also another point where, believe it or not, I do agree with you, Abla. Um, I think it is unrealistic <laughs> from developed countries to say, okay, we did everything wrong. We used coal, we used gas, we used whatever we could fossil fuels for to fuel our development. Now you developing countries, you're not allowed to do it you need to switch to solar panels and to wind farms immediately. I think that's a hypocrisy. I think we need to be able to support developing countries in a trajectory that would include the entire mix that is available. And I think obviously it was a trajectory where ideally one would reduce uh, the greenhouse gas impact gradually, but we cannot, I think this is, it, it's just not feasible, it's not realistic. Developing countries very often have issues related to energy poverty, and that needs to be addressed. And I fully agree with you, 
uh, I, uh, we, we can't go down uh, that road. Now, finally, Miret, to your, to your question. I think, I mean, I may sound like a broken record, but it, I, I think in the end, it really depends on how attractive projects are being developed. I remember a couple of years ago, there was an interesting insert in The Economist. It was all about the need for developing countries to be able to develop their pipeline of investable projects. It was all about how MDBs, bilateral development finance institution, bilateral cooperation would actually put the focus on that. Because if, if we do, even as, as Abla said, there's not enough money for loss and damage or adaptation. But let's assume we had 500 billion a year, we wouldn't be able to deploy them. Where are those projects? We still need that capability. And I think that is the key, absolutely key bottleneck in today's environment. Then still on Miret's point, I think it is artificial to separate climate finance from development finance from infrastructure finance i think it is it doesn't help to separate these three different aspects in the end what matters again is what are what are the instruments that the public sector can deploy for investing into pre feasibility studies into feasibility studies to actually help develop these kinds of projects that would be bankable. How can uh, developing uh, MDBs or uh, other public institutions make sure that a power purchase agreement is worth more than the money it has, uh, more than the paper it has been printed on? What kind of guarantees can be deployed? I think there's a need to reduce the complexity of all that. And in fact, that's the role we at EGA, Edelman Global Advisory, are playing on behalf of our clients. We're saying, look, there are opportunities. That's the risk. That's the opportunity. These are the instruments that are available that, can be, that could be deployed to make your project bankable, investable. Thank you so much. Let me, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to a couple of things that you said, but for now, um, on the mitigation adaptation uh, uh, issue. Paul, um, much, so the, the bulk of the, finan uh, of the financing was going to mitigation. Uh, there's more money going to adaptation than there used to be, but um, the, there's still, it, it, it is odd that the, the fact that adaptation is not getting as much money as it needs to be getting, because in some cases we're, we're past the mitigation. We need to adapt now. So why is money still going? I mean, why are we still not paying enough attention to adaptation? And part of the reason of why adaptation is receiving less attention mm -hmm. is, is more or less summarizing what Nicholas was saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, Government, uh, I mean, you also said that. I mean, also Abla said at some point, you know, these government are completely drawn down by all the emergencies they are dealing with, right? When people, let's say, we just had the food crisis. Yep. Ukraine war come, boom. Yep. And disruption of uh, supply chains. And then you have Ukraine who's providing like uh, uh, the bulk of, uh, I mean, the weight and overs to, uh, to, to developing countries not able to supply. So you have prices hiking up, and then you have a government all of a sudden confronted with a problem that they need to tackle, otherwise it can lead to social unrest, right? So by doing so, this government will up, up, will urge more quickly to address a crisis because they don't have a supply coming from outside. Whereas the main issue that has made the country food and secure is the subsidies on the food stuff. I mean, if subsidies are so high on retail prices of bread and other food stuff, food staple, this does not create incentive for the domestic and private and foreign investors to come and invest in agriculture, for example. Because you know that if you invest in agriculture, Whenever you will crop, you will not sell at the market prices because prices 
are distorted. And this is why you see adaptation, in my view, not necessarily getting the best of the attention, but these things are changing because the reality of climate change is hitting at our doorstep, right? Reality. I mean, when you have water becoming a real kind of a scarcity in many of the countries, I mean, I was in Iraq, places that used to have a lot of water, you go there today, there's no water. You had a lot of communities living around that water place, Today, they don't have any place to, to, to live, and they only have one alternative, is to move to a different place where they can find water. And these kind of situations are going to repeat themselves. The more the crisis on climate continues. So adaptation is an imperative, right? And the imperative of adaptation has also a political and social element to it. Now, how do you fund it is the issue we face. One step, is some reform in pricing so that these sectors which have been held back by lack of market related kind of prices are progressively brought to, to that reality while government are ramping up social safety net to protect the people who are the most vulnerable. There's no reason why everybody should receive subsidies and all of that is just taking the whole economy down. That's one element. The second element is that for the water to continue to flow, we need to change the way we are using it. And for that to happen, we need investment. And this what is coming now. I mean, I will use an example of Egypt initiative around Noafi, which is the nexus between water, food, and energy. The reason why this is powerful is because you see that in, in order to be able to address the issues that are going to concern the majority of the population hit by climate, you need to improve, upgrade the system of water irrigation. You need to make sure that agriculture becomes much more efficient and effective and productive. And then energy, what is supplied to agriculture and, other, and the food system can be green and also more, more efficient. An initiative like that put together by a government will definitively draw attention. Whereas right. if that initiative was not there, attention will not be going to that adaptation part of the problem. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to make a bit of a jump because there are a few things that I wanted to ask. Abla, um, I, I know that you've done some work on this. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the carbon market. How, um, how useful is that? How efficient, how accessible? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, let me let me start by um, just saying a couple of comments on on what my colleagues here said. I mean, we keep on <laughs> commenting back on each other, <laughs> right? Okay. I, I want to separate between loss and damage, like what happened in Pakistan and the disasters and so on, and adaptation. Okay, as in improving the agriculture, improving the way people live, and so on. These are two separate things. I don't want to put them under the same title because they are not. Okay, when you ask Paul, why isn't there enough attention to adaptation? I think one of the key reasons that there is no definition for adaptation. Mitigation is, 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 is working fine because there is a target, there is a definition, there is a deadline, okay? So people know where they're going. What, that, what you cannot define, you cannot measure and you cannot achieve. So, okay. so this is, I think, one of the key things that need to be looked at in, in, in the COP. Um, again, the second comment is about this business of fairness and right, okay? And I agree with you, actually, believe it or not. If we go for the right, it's not going to fly. But if we keep on pushing, okay, it, it will be heard. And I think what we need badly, and this is quite powerful, but I will, I will say it. I don't know if you will agree or not, but I think we do need a new economic order altogether. We need a new Bretton Woods the circumstances now are completely different from the ones that were there when it was created. We need a G20 that has more countries, okay, that are in Africa and in Latin America. We need that the voting system in the World Bank and IMF is not based on the financial contribution, but rather based on those countries, the size of the population, okay, where they are in the world today. We do need a change. This is the core of the problem. All what we're talking about are the symptoms of the problem. The core of the problem, poverty, climate, health issues lies in the fact that the voice of the global south is not heard. 
sorry, Mirat, but I had to say no, this thing. Oh, good. Yeah, now, no, no. Coming, back, coming back to your question, the carbon market is one of the most interesting things. When I had a webinar on it, and naive me, when I had the experts, I asked the question, how can the carbon market help in climate justice? And they told me it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's a commercial, the carbon market is a commercial market yeah. that works actually on the mitigation. You adopt green technology, you things are get better and better, better in the future. It's future oriented. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with achieving climate justice when it should be actually, because there are heavy consumers, okay, or heavy emissions of carbon and ones that are not having those emissions. A, mere, a simple subtraction of one from the other could lead to simple compensation if carbon price is set correctly and so on. It has, of course, its own you know, complicated me mechanism, but it can be talked about. Also, there needs to be a very strong link between climate, uh, 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 between carbon uh, market, okay, and the climate finance, actually. And I agree with, with the development finance, climate finance, carbon market, all of these things need to be connected, okay? You can actually finance climate through the operations of the carbon market, okay? We have to encourage catalytic finance, which is using all sorts of possible funds in order to to, to, to finance uh, uh, the climate. So at this point, carbon market and Article 6 could use a revision, okay, in order to make it a bit more realistic, because at this point, it, it's, it's, a, it's a market of its own, nice and, and everything, and the countries that can prepare themselves enough to be able to penetrate the carbon market benefit. And this is something that Africa and developing countries need to do. But then at the end of the day, this is all mitigation, all right? we need to talk about now and what is happening now on the present. And, and I think a certain revision here would help. Okay, so I, I, I do want to talk about it, but we don't have very much time. I especially want to talk about the revolution that you want to kick off, but uh, uh, with the new yes. report, but we don't Raising have Raising the time. flag. But, yeah, but, but I want Raising to jump, the flag. Exactly. But I want to jump back to Nicholas for, um, I think, our, our final question, because we've got about five minutes. Um, we have governments, we have businesses, and then we have uh, people like your good self, sir, who are in the middle, who are trying to provide, uh, 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 you know, you're, you're the babble fish in uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or the translator. How do you um, how do you how do you see this role and how I mean what's how do we get the best out of people like yourself who've been on both sides and who understand what is required? Well, to get the best out of people like myself, we would need far more time. But uh, yes. <laughs> but anyway, yes. no, I think uh, in five minutes. <laughs> what I often say is that uh, one of the skills we have is that we speak two languages. Yep. And that is the public sector language and the private sector language. And it is important to be able to understand the expectation of one side and the expectation of the other. And too often um, there is a lack of dialogue or there are too high expectations from one side towards the other or from the other rather. And I think that's where we, uh, where we come in. So if we take the example again of um, mitigation and renewable energy, for instance, I think where we can come in is we can guide both governments in uh, helping them establish the right framework conditions for, let's say, the power sector. So what kind of uh, framework need to be set up? Uh, how would the power market look like? What would be the um, permit, uh, permitting processes and so on and so forth? We would also be able to support the private sector potential interest, uh, interested parties to say, okay, well, from this entire range, which could be a virtuous cycle of from pre-feasibility, feasibility, engineering, procurement, construction, operational phase, and possibly even uh, crowding in institutional investors into operational operating assets, we can provide advice throughout that change, and we can provide advice particularly by saying, these are the instruments that are available that can make your project 
become economically viable? And how can we mobilize these instruments from which party, for which countries, for which kind of sectors? So I think it's just having this overview of the global architecture, which is constantly changing and being able to deploy all these instruments. And that's why I said before, it is artificial to separate climate finance from infrastructure finance from development finance. I think we need to look at the different kinds of risks that can be addressed by each of these instruments. Thank you so much. Um, we could go on for a very long time, but we have two minutes. So um, I would like to wrap up. If there's anyone who would like to, to wrap up in, in, in a minute, uh, that would be great. But um, if not, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. I would really like to thank our panelists for honestly what has been one of the most engaging panels we've had in a while. Um, Dr. Paul Number Ong, Dr. Abdel Abdel Latif, Dr. Nicholas Schultz, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you uh, 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 to our um, viewers today. And, and, and I want to thank you, Mireille, because I forgot to thank you at the beginning. So I'm doing it at the end. Okay? Oh, great. Thank you for thank inviting you. me. Okay. Th thank you for joining us. And, and uh, do please uh, um, stick with us on more work on, uh, uh, on climate change.